My name's Deborah Pout, and um, I'm the founder of the Oxford Media Network. Welcome on behalf of Lord Lothian, Chairman of the Global Strategy uh, Forum and Oxford Media Network. Welcome to the event, The Negotiators, Those in the Shadows. I need to say a few thank yous before um, we start to Dr. Rasmus Nielsen, Director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, Dr. David Levy, Paddy Coulter, Michael Crick, John Lloyd, Rena Levy, <laughs> and Jenny Darnley. Um, the inspiration for this event came from Joel Murray's documentary, The Human Factor, which is a gripping account from the perspective of the US negotiators over 25 years of Middle East peace um, negotiations. Today, hopefully, we're going to get a peek into the often unseen world of the negotiators. We are delighted to have Tom Tugendhat, um, MP and Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we're incredibly grateful that you spared time out of your busy schedule to chair this event. Um, Tom is uniquely well-placed to chair this event. He's a former soldier, a former journalist in Beirut, uh, and he uh, has the perfect yeah, credentials to chair this event. So I'm going to hand over to Tom now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I may have the perfect credentials to chair it, but I, I, don't, have the, uh, I don't have the insight and the skill uh, that our two guests have. So. I first came across Jonathan's work uh, probably at the same time as many of you did when he was uh, fulfilling that hereditary position for a Powell, which is to be chief of staff. Oh, sorry, I forgive me. You're a Powell, he was a Powell, exactly. The hereditary position of being chief of staff to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, um, which is, you know, quite remarkable for, for a family to have been at the heart of many of the negotiations that we've conducted over the last 40 years. There are various elements that one can focus on, on Jonathan's career, but of course the first one, I think, when, which is the most shining success that this country's had in negotiating in, I'd say, about 50 years, actually, was the extraordinary peace process that Jonathan was key to delivering in Northern Ireland. Uh, yes, I think you'd credit it, you built on work of many others, including Sir John Major and uh, other negotiators before you, but completing that uh, accord was a remarkable success at a very complex time, and I think that's one of the areas I'm going to be focusing some questions and hoping to stimulate some dialogue. I'm also very, very pleased to have Dror here because Dror has uh, witnessed, catalogued, identified and recorded so many of those essentially human moments, the incredibly personal elements of negotiation that have led to not quite such a success, I've got to be honest, but I don't think we can blame you for that, Dror. Um, <laughs> in the Middle East, where there's the challenge of the ongoing negotiations has been absolutely seminal. And if you haven't seen The Human Factor, then I strongly recommend it. It is on, uh, available on all good bookshops or whatever, how do you put it? If, available on all good pod platforms. I think it's Apple TV. Yeah, they've got it. And it's, it's a remarkable insight into the thoughts behind the press release, the thoughts behind the talks, the thoughts behind the announcements that came out. Uh, over the Middle East in the recent, well, the recent decades, really. And it's extraordinarily powerful to see the humanity and consideration that is so often reduced to a single slogan or a soundbite, but actually underpins all these negotiations. Now, my own experience of negotiating is significantly humbler than um, any of, of, of those two achievements. I, but I have spent much of the last 20 years in various different ways negotiating on behalf of our government in different ways. And I'm always struck at the importance of the humanity of the actors. One of the incidents that I particularly remember was in 2000 and, uh, late 2006, early 2007, I was negotiating with tribal elders from Miskala in Northern Helmand. And these were a collection of gentlemen, uh, and yes, they were all men, this is Helmand, this is uh, uh, they all had very, very grey beards, and they came to Lashkagar to talk about the changing power dynamics in their community and what it meant for them. 
And it wasn't a negotiation so much about the status of the Taliban or the presence of the drug industry. It was fundamentally a human conversation about what it is that they thought their family were going to be able to achieve in the next five, ten years, in the next generation, generation after that, and how they could shape the future for themselves. And what was struck me about their thinking was this is a group of people from a remarkably isolated community. The mountains of Northern Helmand are about as cut off as you can be from the modern world without actually going to the moon. And yet there they were, talking about things that were happening in China or in the West. They were talking about negotiations in Tehran. They were discussing uh, oil flows in the Middle East. Now, I'm not saying they were always right, but they were at least aware of huge numbers of issues that were going on around them. And they were filtering it all through into their own world and discussing what these effects would have on them and then what the talks effects would have on their family and how, if they got the decision right or wrong, their children and their grandchildren would pay for their errors, either in the classic Afghan sense by being murdered by somebody next door or simply the consequences of the economic change would be hugely undermining. And I think that's where I'd like to start this conversation, if I may. You've been in negotiations where that humanity is so often divorced from the individual because they become a totem, whether it's Tony Blair as an image, not a person, whether it's uh, Martin McGuinness as a, an image, not a person. You've been in those rooms, and clearly you're dealing with people. How do you first approach the conversation? Um, do you want to, Why not? Yeah. Why okay, well, let me start off, which is I didn't, the first time I met, knowingly, two terrorists, um, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, at the end of 1997, um, October 1997, I didn't feel very warm and cuddly about them. They had shot my father in 1940 and injured him. They had uh, put my brother on a death list for eight years while he worked for Mrs. Thatcher. And I refused to shake their hands in the first meeting with them. Tony Blair was much more sensible and did shake hands, and I was clearly wrong in retrospect. I was surprised some, uh, I think it was about a week later, I got a call from Martin McGuinness in number 10, and he said, come see me in Derry incognito and don't tell the securocrats, don't tell the police and the army. So I asked Tony, and he said, yeah, you're expendable, go, off you go. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and I took a plane to, uh, to Belfast and a taxi to Derry, and I stood on a street corner feeling very, very foolish. And uh, two guys with shaved heads turned up and pushed me into the back of a taxi and drove me around for an hour until I was completely lost. And then pushed me out to uh, uh, the door of a modern little house, and I knocked on the door, and Martin McGuinness came to the door on crutches and made a very unfunny joke about kneecapping, uh, as you remember the way they punish people. And I spent three hours with them in the safe house. The lady of the house had gone away and left us some sandwiches, and there was a fire in the grate. And we talked for three hours. We made absolutely no breakthroughs at all. But it came clear to me that if you are going to make a negotiation like this work, you have to be able to build trust. It's all about, and that's what comes out of the, out of, uh, the human factor. The very first words, really, from Dennis Ross are about trust. How do you build trust? And that's what I then tried to spend the next 10 years doing, while trying to be chief of staff in number 10 Downing Street, also going backwards and forwards across the Irish Sea to meet Adams and McGuinness in safe houses in Belfast and Derry, uh, in Dublin, uh, monasteries and places like that, and then meeting the unionists to try and build that trust and get somewhere. And it's that all about that, and that's what Tony Blair managed to do, uh, crucially with, with Sinn Féin, because previous governments had had a lot of difficulty for understandable reasons building trust with Sinn Féin. But also, interestingly, with Ian Paisley. Uh, when Ian Paisley took over from David Trimble, we thought the, the process was over, there was going to be no peace. And we asked Peter Robinson what to do. I remember we got Peter Robinson in Leeds Castle to come up to Tony's bedroom in this grand four-poster bed, and he sat down on it, and he said, how do we actually get this to work? And Peter said, you're going to have to build a relationship with Ian Paisley. It's the only way it can work. So Tony started inviting Paisley into number 10, and he'd sit there and talk to him about religion. Well, no, 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 they, they discussed religion, because both of them were interested in religion, not a subject that appeals to me, but the, um, they would sit there and talk, and I'd hear laughter coming in, and they were talking about things like grace and things like that. And I'd go in and say, what have you agreed on the peace process? And say, absolutely nothing. Uh, and they even left once a track to look a religious track for Leo, who is this infant, you know, young child of Tony Blair. So building trust is absolutely crucial, and that's one of the things that comes out of human factor, I think. I think that's right. Draw, why don't you start telling us a bit? Because one of the things, of course, that Jonathan had the advantage of... Sorry. You mean we're showing the film first? Oh, we're showing the film first. Oh, forgive me, I do apologise. <laughs> Middle East peace is always a very attractive proposition. 
It's a very sexy topic. I cannot think of a Secretary of State that did not want to get involved in, in the Middle East. And by the way, all of them think they can reinvent the wheel. Arafat is beaming. For him, he's arrived. This was emotionally wrenching for Rabin, knowing he was going to have to shake Arafat's hand. It was history in the making. The idea of breaking through that taboo was just unbelievable. And I can see that something changes in the relationship. They had moved from being adversaries to partners in peace. We say to you today, in a loud and a clear voice, enough of blood and tears. Enough. When I look back now, we saw the world the way we wanted it to be. We did not see the world the way it was. He expects there's going to be a civil war within Israel. He said, take risk for peace, and, and now he's dead. It's obviously still a moment that I really can't talk about. This is getting out of control, and we can't stop it. All of our efforts have gone up in flames. King Hussein says to Bibi, you have to grow up and become a leader, and you're not one today. The lesson was, what pays? Is it diplomacy or is it violence? I said, he's coming here, he's full of suspicions. He feels as a gang up. It's always easy to have an enemy out there. People just love to demonize the other side. When you look at the animosity and the hatred that exists, the human side is completely out. You can't ignore the human factor. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I'm a storyteller, definitely. For me, the issue is how to tell a story. And I will tell a small story how this project started. It basically started in a place called Aspen in America. There was an Aspen Ideas Festival, which all the main politicians, thinkers of America come for two weeks, and they are debating what to do in the next year or two years. And there was a screening of my movie, The Gatekeepers, um, and Dennis Ross was hosting the Q&A after that. This was the first time that I met him. And at the end of the Q&A, he asked me, OK, you were nominated for the Academy Award for this movie, The Gatekeepers. What is your next project? And I said to him, look, I would like to round up five, six secretaries of state in front of me, like I did with The Gatekeepers. And I would, I would like to ask him one question. Everybody laughed in the, I mean, Madeleine Albright was there, Condoleezza Rice was there, Queen Rania was there, seeing a movie. And I said, no, I'm not laughing. I would like to ask, why did you decide to intervene in Libya? And in Syria, you decided not to intervene. What goes on inside the rooms? So there was silence in the room. And then he says, well, it's a good idea. I might help you in that. So in front of everybody, I said to him, can we shake on that? And we shook hands, and he opened the door in Washington for me, basically, to do uh, my next project, which is called The Corridors of Power. One of the characters that I wanted to interview was Henry Kissinger for Corridors of Power. And Henry wanted to meet me before he will agree to be interviewed with Dennis. And then when we got into his office, he basically said, oh, sit down. I would like to speak with Dennis now. And it was before the signing of the Iranian nuclear deal, the last one in 2015. And Kissinger was about to give a testimony to the Senate Foreign Relations. And one, I think it was the most mesmerizing 30 minutes I have witnessed. I want, like you are wishing to be the fly on the wall. Basically, he grilled Dennis. It was, he asked him question about what will be the response of Bibi Netanyahu, what will be the response of the Supreme Leader in Iran. And he was basically preparing himself for the Senate committee, but I was kind of, wow. This is what goes on probably in the White House. And when I went down with Dennis, I, asked, I said to him, look, you know, Dennis, we always get outside. I mean, I've seen so many articles and movies about the Israeli-Palestinian, the Israeli-Arab negotiations. I've never got 
to really hear what happened there inside the rooms when those, you always have this very well-crafted statesman outside the door, but you never really hear the stories of what went there. Will you be willing to participate in a, in a movie? He said, let me think about it. And then the next day he said, okay, I will come. I don't think he understood what, he, what was waiting for him because I interviewed him during the two years for more than 35 hours. Um, all the rest of the negotiators, which he brought to me also, at least 15 to 20 hours, each one of them. And um, for me, it was a fascinating process because I knew, I knew what happened in front of the cameras. I didn't know what happened before behind the cameras. And why America failed, I would say, in the most extensive and intensive process that they put the diplomacy, American diplomacy tried to achieve something, and they failed miserably. They did, I mean, the situation now is much worse than what it was when the process started. And I wanted to understand why was the failure, what, where was the failure. And so I got the interviews, and then we got into the editing room, and slowly what came out from the material is the importance of the human factor. The importance of what never is, is discussed because you know, you speak about Jerusalem, you speak about refugees, you speak about the right of returns. You never speak about the relation between the, the leaders and, and, and the negotiator and the job of the negotiators. Mm -hmm. And it was so, the stories were so mesmerizing. I mean, one story which stood up to me, which when Clint, after the assassination of Rabin, Clinton is on the plane to come to Israel, to the, to the funeral and basically asked Dennis, what kind of Israel will I find? And then he said to him, you will find a country that is completely in shock, and you, Paris is completely, does it, you know, Rabin was his anchor, you have to be that one. And there is a moment where Clinton comes out of the plane and hugs Paris, and basically uh, what Dennis said is that in that moment, Clinton took on himself the job of fulfilling Rabin's legacy. From that moment, it was completely another, another Clinton. And moment like that came out all the time throughout the editing of the movie. And look, the one character that stayed throughout the process with all the prime minister is Yasser Arafat. And he went through Rabin, Bibi, Barak, and at the end with Sharon. And you can see how the relations between him and the different prime, Israeli prime minister affected the negotiation and, and changed what the outcome could have been. I believe that if Rabin would have, would have not been assassinated, we would have a, a de definitely a different outcome uh, if there was a kind of a Camp David between Rabin and, and, and Arafat. And the other thing is that, the, the, which was very present in, in, my, in my research and is the importance of the chief negotiators. And in that sense, as I told you before, all the negotiators agree that if Jim Baker would have stayed as Secretaries of State in America and would not be replaced by the Clinton administration, Warren Christopher, we would have peace in the Middle East now. So, and this, the tragedy here is what I called the unbalanced clocks. When you have a good Secretaries of State in, in office or a president, you don't have a, a Palestinian leader. When you have a good Palestinian leader who is willing to go, there is no Israeli leader who is willing to go. So the clocks are never kind of aligned together. And in order to reach a, a really peace in the Middle East, which I'm very, very skeptical now, that it can be achieved, you really need great leaders on both sides and a mediator and, and a president or hopefully European will st somehow step in someone from also that can take that burden on himself. I think that covers a huge area <laughs> we're going to probe more into. I just, I mean, out of personal curiosity, how on earth do you get people to sit down for 20 hours? <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable achievement. Well, look, I think, well, uh, it's also with the gatekeepers and also with corridors of power. I think I reach those people at a point in life where they understand that Probably in their life they are not going to see a change, and they want to speak. They want to share their insights, they want to share what happened there, and they are an amazing storyteller. And I'm an amazing, I think, uh, listener to them. Really? So 
I allow them to speak, and that's that's. It's a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> want to get their part of the story across. It's why Bob Woodward's books work. Everyone wants to make sure they're not being done down by anyone else. And if you don't cooperate, you're going to be the target if you're not part of it. You know, the recent series on Blair Brown, where uh, everyone wanted to participate and gave tens of hours to the interviewers, of which few minutes were used. That always happens. Can I just pick up the point that um, Draw ended on about leadership? Yeah. I think that is fundamental. When I look back at all negotiations, particularly of internal disputes, it, it, the, the two factors that make a successful negotiation are a mutually hurting stalemate, what, what, uh, which might talk about Ukraine and that at some stage, but, and then leadership. You know, if you think about South Africa, you wouldn't have had peace process that worked if you hadn't had Nelson Mandela prepared to be forgiving of the past, and if you hadn't had F.W. de Klerk, you needed both of them, the alignment of leaders. And so I think we were lucky in, in, in Northern Ireland in that we, uh, you know, Adams and McGuinness, as leaders of the Republican movement, have seen nine prime ministers come and go. But then Tony Blair was there for a long time, and Bertie Ahern in Ireland was there for a long time. In his autobiography, Tony Blair says that I say he succeeded in Northern Ireland because he had a messiah complex. In fact, it was Mo Molum, who is rather colourful looking language, as you might recall, who told me that Tony thought he was effing Jesus, which is not quite the same as a messiah complex, but, it, but, but, but it's closely related. And I think it was, I think John Major really deserves a huge amount of credit for taking the political risk to no gain and never any prospect of gain to start the process. But I think, and he was different from Mrs. Thatcher, but I think never believed there could be a peace in Northern Ireland. I think John Major believed there could be, but he couldn't get there. And Tony Blair had that belief that he could do it and it could be done. To be fair, the, the Anglo-Irish agreement, which she came to with um, Jerry Fitzgerald, yeah. um, was a remarkable achievement in itself in moving the conversation yeah. forward. So uh, I don't wish to, you know, but you, she... You, you were building on the shoulders of others very much. Absolutely, absolutely. and this is relevant to the Middle East too. That, um, and it wasn't just that. We had Sunningdale in '73, which was a remarkable agreement. Uh, then we had the uh, Anglo-Irish Agreement, which my brother Charles participated yeah. in with uh, Mrs. Thatcher. And then we had the Downing Street Declaration. None of them worked, but the Good Friday Agreement didn't come from nowhere. It built on the shoulders of those agreements. In fact, Seamus Mallon called the Good Friday Agreement Sunningdale for slow learners, because uh, it had the same provisions on power sharing as Sunningdale had. And in, Colombia, where I worked for eight years, the same thing. There had been four previous peace processes in Colombia. They'd all failed, but the process uh, that uh, Manuel Santos ran was built on the, actually the, particularly the failures of the previous process in Caguan, where there was a 100-point agenda, including the end of capitalism, and all the, tele all the negotiations were televised. So we learned the lessons of those failures and built on them, which is why I'm, I'm less... I mean, Draw has much more knowledge than me, but I'm less pessimistic about the Middle East. It's terrible at the moment because there's no leadership and there's no mutually hurting stalemate. But one day there will be a solution, even in the Middle East. Can I, <laughs> can I come to a, to a subject that's at, on everybody's mind at the moment? You've already touched on it, which is, of course, Ukraine. Because we're all watching, or at least I am anyway, and we're, I think we're all watching a, a pretty inspirational leader in, in Volodymyr Zelensky, who has managed to do... I mean, he's managed to do two things. I think the first one is in some ways more remarkable than the second. But the first thing he managed to do is he managed to unite a country between 2019 and 2022 at a time when the country was extraordinarily divided and totally broken between you know, various different factions. So that when the Russian invasion came, there was a, a united country that could resist. He's now got an extraordinary coalition of allies behind him supporting his uh, defense of his people and his defense of, of his country. But he still has a large part of the country occupied and lots of people being killed every day. Is there a conversation there that you can see happening? Is there a, is there the leadership that you could see happening? I, th I think I can see it on one side. I'm not at all convinced I can see it on the other. Um, uh, I'll I draw to be a bit, but, 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 the, but the, I mean, uh, yes, Zelensky has shown remarkable leadership. You have to remember he was at 30% popularity before this war started. He had <coughs> lost a lot of credit since the election for a number of missteps that he'd made in the way there but he has certainly come into his own as a war leader in a quite extraordinary way. To be fair to him, unlike the government here, he does say that there will have to be a negotiation. He says, the only way to end this war, even last week, he was talking about we have to keep the bridges that exist alive. I think actually he went too far in the earlier stages of the negotiation. He offered too much, on, even on terms of territory, and he got pulled back by the Ukrainian people uh, and by the other political parties in Ukraine. Um, can Putin ever be a leader who can make peace? I don't know. He's never shown the ability to, uh, to compromise. He's always fooled around with negotiations, as with the original Minsk agreement, where he built in a trap that the Ukrainians could never get round and they were dumb enough to, 
to sign up to it under French and German pressure. But you couldn't complain he's not a strong leader. He may not be a leader you like, but if he wanted to deliver peace, he could. So at some stage, I still believe there will be a negotiation. Clearly not now. Uh, but if you did have a mutually hurting stalemate and you did have leadership, then there could be one. Draw, you've told so many stories. How would you tell this one? Because I think, how do you see this story going? Who would you want to interview? Look, as I said, in the corridors of power, I interviewed all living secretaries of state. And it, was, it is about how America takes decision in, to intervene in cases of genocide, crimes against humanity, and, and war crimes, which is definitely what's happening now in Ukraine. If I would sum up my conclusion from this seven year already of working on that project, is in one sentence, America is tired. America is tired in being the world's policeman, alone, without sharing the burden with other nations. I think it is shown more than ever what you see now is a conclusion or, or something that came after the non, not intervening in Syria. In Syria, more than 600,000 people died, 14, 15 million refugees, carnage which you cannot even bear to imagine, and the world basically flipped to the other channel, America as well. And I think Vladimir Putin learned his lesson from that. He saw that, he thought, that he could, by air power, do what he, in Ukraine what he did in, in Syria, but he, he found that the reality is completely different. And if I started the project on the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the speech of George H. W. Bush about a new world order, I think we are now starting at an era of a new world order which nobody knows where the domino, with dominoes will fall what will be the new world order, and uh, the conflict in Ukraine is the center of that. I think Biden understands that, I think Putin understands that. <laughs> and going back to the human factor, and I'm a strong believer in psychology, I don't see Putin backing down. And, and I don't know what you think, but uh, you are definitely a strong believer in negotiations. I believe in people, in, in the psychology of people, and I don't see Putin, he understands what's at stake here. And there's a lot of actors who are waiting for what the outcome of what's going on in Ukraine. Iran is one, China is the second, there's a lot of people waiting to see what will, what will be the outcome of Ukraine. That leads on to so many different areas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one last question, which um, I'm interested in both of your views on, before I think we're opening it up to the to everybody else. My last question is about the negotiator themselves. You've now either been in the room as the negotiator or worked for a principal or interviewed them. How much leeway does the negotiator have from the politician or from the political leader? How does that relationship work? I mean, clearly it's got to be one of trust. That's the obvious thing to say. But how does it actually work so that when you walk back from your uh, holiday in Derry, um, into number 10 and go and see Tony and say, right, these are the areas we need to think about, mm -hmm. or this is where I see the deal landing. How do you have that conversation so that he's not totally surprised by the outcome? And how do you structure it so that you've got the freedom to negotiate? And I'll come to you in a second. Yeah, I think it's a crucial, crucial factor. Uh, well, it's actually a crucial factor in Russia. The reason we know Putin wasn't negotiating seriously was he sent a delegation of people who are complete no-counts. Uh, so he, he clearly wasn't taking it seriously. Um, in, in the case of Northern Ireland, I think it was important that Tony used someone to do the negotiations who was well, his intimate, if you like, his servant. <laughs> um, and uh, there could be no question that I was representing what the Prime Minister thought. And one of the problems with government since is they tried to, number 10 has tried to get out of Northern Ireland and have nothing to do with it. And basically the trouble in Northern Ireland has always been when the British are not paying attention, which is most of the time. Uh, and you need to pay attention. So because I was, I mean, it was quite difficult to combine with being chief of staff doing this stuff, but it was important to do it because I could go over and uh, uh, Sinn Féin knew I was speaking with Tony Blair's authority and the unionists knew I was speaking with his authority. If I said something would happen, it, it would happen. It, it again came home to me from the film, uh, The Human Factor, that the Americans were mediators in the Middle East between Palestine and Israel. They weren't unbiased, as you pointed out in your questions in that film, 
but they were powerful mediators. They could change things on the ground. They could change things in security terms. They could change things in economic terms. In Northern Ireland, we and the Irish government were powerful mediators. We could actually do things. We could make things happen. We weren't just people who ch came along and had a chat and tried to get, them to get along with each other. We could actually really uh, alter things. And so I think that was, the, um, uh, was, was a crucial factor. Had we just left it to the Northern Ireland office or to the Northern Ireland secretary, it wouldn't work. But Tony Blair had decided he was going to put his political capital into resolving this issue uh, and was prepared to, right from the very first, his first visit outside Northern Ireland was to go to the Balmoral Agricultural Show uh, in Belfast seven days after he was elected in order to reassure the unionists that he was not going to be some mad na nationalist on the other side uh, and to work to try and get to a peace agreement. So his commitment, his willingness to spend political capital and having a, a negotiator who uh, clearly represented his views at every stage it was sometimes frustrating. I remember a number of occasions having to work, negotiate through the night with Sinn Féin, who regarded that as a form of punishment to get revenge for Castlereagh. It was their type of interrogation. I'd have to sit there right through the night hearing their 26 points they wanted considered and saying no to each of them. Uh, and I would call Tony and say, I'm going to leave. I can't stand it anymore. And he'd say, no, go back in, stay there. So I was on a very tight leash in terms of Tony, but you people knew that's what I I couldn't have suddenly agreed there's going to be United Ireland, no. no, no. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> See, um, it's a great question. Because um, it, it, it's different. I mean, for example, Dennis Ross, who was the chief negotiator through the Baker period and then the Clinton period, it was a completely different story when Baker was the Secretary of State and when Christopher was the Secretary of State. His job changed with the, cha with the change of the Secretaries of State. In, with, with Christopher, he was much more involved, much more engaged, he had much more power. Then we, Baker was much more hands-on. He didn't let anything go off his track and, 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 and he decide, let them decide. He was much more wanting results and all of that. And it, I mean, negotiators are crucial. And I think today you see that more and more diplomacy is not, I mean, especially in the White House, are done by the White House and not by professional dip, diplomats. And it's crucial because professional diplomats understand the grievances, of the, the grievances of the parties on the ground much more than, the, let's say, the president or the White House who comes from his point of view. And it's crucial for a successful, let's say, outcome. You have to give those mediators a lot of leeway, but they have to answer to someone. At the end of the day, you know, it's the two parties. And I think I agree completely. In South Africa, you had very unique two leaders uh, the clerk and Mandela, which made that happen, in Northern Ireland as well, in the Middle East we haven't found, we haven't found we are still looking for the Messiah to come. Probably only when he comes we will have peace in the Middle East. Until then, <laughs> we have to wait. The Messiah does come rather often in the Middle East. That's, <laughs> that may be part of the problem. The I, I'm interested because the reason I, I ask it is because. One of the problems I found negotiating in Afghanistan in my first job there in 2005 was the very strong interest of Washington and London. And actually, I found the long screwdriver and the lack of understanding a hindrance to it. And the process that we were working with, of course, was in the aftermath of 2001 and 9-11 and all the rest of it. And you remember the bond talks. I'm not sure how involved you were, but you were... You were you, but you were, in, the, you were in, the, in number 10 at the time, when various Afghans came up with various answers and they were vetoed by Americans or Europeans or whoever it was at various different points. And so you do sort of wonder, some negotiations are about you and some negotiations are not about you. Mm -hmm. And if they are not about you, there is a danger that countries like ours, countries like the United States, can make them about you. And on the human factor, how much do you think those peace talks became about America and not about Israel-Palestine? How much do you think they are today? Well, today there's nothing. Sure. Uh, I, 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 look, one of the, Aaron David Miller t told me that we cannot want peace more than the parties themselves. And at one point, the American negotiator found themselves much more engaged than the parties themselves. <laughs> he gave me an example that he went on the Shuhada road in Hebron with the measuring tape to, to, to see what... And, and what he said is sometimes when you are negotiating, it's better to sit in, in, 
in the stadium, not on the sidelines, because then you can see really the story. And I think the American negotiators were too involved for sure. America has a lot of leeway on Israel, much more than they think. And they can pressure much more than they are doing. And at the end of the day, Israel is the strong part in this. And, and the, Palestinians, the Palestinians have only one thing, they can say yes. That's the only thing that they have. Beside that, they don't have anything. They, they have only one thing, which they can say no as well, which they are doing. And I mean, the Americans can create an atmosphere, can bring the parties together, but at the end of the day, it's the two parties. They don't have power over the local politics. And I will come back to Henry Kissinger, who said, you know, Israel doesn't have a foreign policy. She has, they have only internal policy. And you know, now, with the settlers, with the right wing, with the rise of the right wing, it's an, a, a mission for uh, a messiah. <laughs> right, well, I think, I think there's any number of different ways we can go down, and I'd be very grateful for your thoughts. How do, how do you want to do this? Is there a microphone or? Here we go, there's a gentleman here, and uh, somebody next to him, and there's a lady here. And, and there's a lady over there. Thank you, Ali Bahaji of Dorsal Publications. Uh, following the uh, local elections in Northern Ireland, uh, there is a problem now with the uh, uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Do you think that is going to be a, a sort of a way of dismantling what you have already achieved, or there is a way out? And also, you mentioned that you were rather p pessimist about uh, the Middle East. Is that because the Americans actually shifted their uh, interest from the Middle East to Asia? And of course, there is weariness about what's going on there as well. Thank you. Why don't you start off, you start off with the easy one? The easy one, Northern Ireland. Um, well, there is a way out. I'm not certain this government is going to take the way out on, on Northern Ireland. As someone has been pointing out for some years, that uh, Northern Ireland was the insoluble problem for Brexit because if you have Brexit and you and leave the single market in the customs union, it has to be a border somewhere. You can have the border on the island of Ireland, but that would cause catastrophic damage to the Good Friday Agreement uh, and uh, would be completely in your face. Boris Johnson decided instead to put the border in the Irish Sea. Um, having done so, uh, he then, um, uh, well, he must have known all along that this caused a serious problem for the unionists, although it took a long time for it to manifest itself because their identity depends on being part of the United Kingdom. As soon as you put a border in, uh, that identity is threatened. So the unionists have a point about this, and it was always going to be the outworking of the way uh, that Brexit was implemented. Theresa May found a very complicated Heath Robinson system to try and avoid that problem. Um, so the protocol is, has been made into uh, a, a serious problem for the peace process, and the DUP are trying to use it as a blackmail to the government to say they won't, or to the Europeans actually more correctly, to say they won't go back into government uh, with Sinn Féin until... Uh, uh, the protocol is got rid of. Now, the protocol can't be got rid of because the unionists themselves haven't put forward any alternative to the protocol. There has to be a border somewhere. Now, the border can be made to work more smoothly, and that's what the EU has offered to do. Uh, I think the EU should be pressed to do even more than they've offered to do, but they've offered to do that. What the British government does all the time is simply make threats. They say they're going to unilaterally get rid of the protocol, or they're going to trigger Article 16. That would simply force us back into another negotiation. It would cause a trade war with the EU for the UK as a whole, which would be a very serious problem on top of what we already have. But it would not solve the problem in Northern Ireland because the majority of people in Northern Ireland, as manifested in this latest election, do not want, to, uh, do not want the protocol to go away. They, want, they think that's the best answer to the problem that's been forced on them by Brexit. Um, what I fear may happen uh, is that this government will carry on messing around with this protocol issue and prevent us getting out of the political crisis. This will, and therefore prevent us getting the institutions back. That will not tip us back into the troubles, back into civil war. But what it will do is it will uh, poison the discussion, the political discussion in Northern Ireland to a very high degree. And you'll get some rioting on the streets in the, what are called the White Nights of May and June and July. But the real problem is that it brings back the issue of identity. The point of the Good Friday Agreement was to lower the issue of identity as the salient issue in, in Northern Irish politics and raise other issues like health and cost of living and things like that. What this has done is put identity back up there. And as soon as you do that, with the changing demographics, increasing number of Catholics, and the, the uh, referendum this uh, year will probably show there are more Catholics than Protestants in Northern Ireland, although it will also show a growing gap in the middle of people. Um, uh, 
that will increase the fear on the unionist side that we're moving inexorably towards United Ireland, although so far the polls have not moved in that direction. So what I fear is that this government and the way it's handled both Brexit and the protocol will just lead to a continue, continuing political crisis in Northern Ireland built around uh, identity which will stop Northern Ireland being able to move forward. And that is really uh, quite disappointing for some of us who spent some decades trying to make peace in Northern Ireland. Draw. <coughs> You get, you get the difficult question. <laughs> I said there is no hope because when you see the leadership on all sides, on the Palestinian side, uh, you have Abu Mazen, who is 86 years old now. He's definitely not going to take very bold decisions in, in the near future. And when he's gone, which will happen, nobody knows who will replace him. On Gaza Strip, you have Hamas, who is doesn't want anything to do with Israel or to agree that Israel will exist. On the Israeli front, now you have a government which is um, you know, held by, by nothing. It's just the anti-Bibi, anti-Netanyahu government. There is no connection between the far left and the far right, which are, or the right, which are in the government. So all these make, and you see that the, uh, in Israel, the, the settlements are growing. Settlers are in the government now. So all that make it really, un, there is no hope for, for something. It will take decades, I think, until um, something will happen. And you know, the sentence that ends the, the human factor is by Gamal, who is, uh, he's not a Jew, like all the negotiators. He's a Coptic uh, Egyptian, Arabic, and knows the Arab world very well, and he says, that the, the chance for a two-state solution is gone. And I agree with him. I don't think that there is a chance anymore for a two-state solution. I think with the reality of what needs to be done in a two-state solution uh, in order to achieve the two-state solution, there is no leader on each, is each side who can take those gigantic decisions. Like, for example, the Israelis to give up the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, or to divide Jerusalem. Like for the Palestinians, to give up the right of return, which will allow Palestinians to come into Israel. So I don't see a lot of hope. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, sir, and there was a lady here as well. And we might have to take questions in twos already. I'm seeing people. Go um, for it. Uh, I um, found you, what you had to say about uh, Rabin and um, Arafat. Um, <coughs> very interesting and in fact I agree with you because Arafat did tell me that if uh, Rabin had been alive he would have been able to make peace. But one thing uh, that's always struck in my mind since Arafat died was, was he able to deliver? Because I tried to deliver with him and he'd split his organization into 13 different groups and he couldn't get them all together again. That was just before he died. <clears throat> Simply, I will, I will say what the negotiator told me, because they knew Arafat much better than me. <laughs> Gamal said that uh, Arafat was a folk leader. He wasn't really a statesman. He enjoyed very much to be in the center of things and that he controls everything. And the tough decisions, nobody knows whether he would be able to take them. And that's where I come back to the personalities of the people that are there. And that's why I believe that if Arafat would have had Rabin in front of me, and not Barak, which he despised at Camp David, and Rabin would have managed to build the trust and to build the, what the Palestinian authorities need, needed to do, um, maybe we, we, we would have had peace. But it's only, you know, in hindsight, and it is what if. The what ifs, it can go either way. It's, th that's the tragedy of the thing. One, one interesting story that I was told by when I did the gatekeepers is that before, before the assassination of Rabin, when, when the Palestinian streets, was the, the suicide bombings in Israel were there, Rabin asked Arafat for a meeting with all the, his security chiefs, Arafat security chiefs. And Arafat agreed, and they arranged this meeting in, in Tel Aviv. And Rabin said to them, you know, if you want a country or a state in the future, you have to fight the terrorist organization. You cannot allow inside your operations to have a terrorist organization who are 
you, and he gave an example how he shot. He was the one that shot the Altalena, the ship that brought arms to Israel before Israel was announced from the Etzel, from the underground. From the, and he gave that as an example what, how you need to maintain a law-abiding state. And if you won't do that, there will never be a state or there will never be kind. If you allow all those kind of frictions of terrorist organization to live amongst you, you will never reach a state. And regrettably, he was assassinated two months later, and, and the rest is history. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for very insightful, very very good insights. My question is, have you interviewed female negotiators? And if yes, what's their human factor? And what's the dynamics they can bring in the room and the agenda item? That's a great question again. <laughs> I believe that women should be much more involved. I, uh, that's my personal belief. I believe that women bring to the table something that men doesn't have and will never have. Um, no, I didn't interview uh, female negotiators or mediators because there weren't any. No. I interviewed Madeleine Albright for the other projects and, and uh, also a nice story uh, which she told when she was in Bosnia and she said that she was driving through the streets of Sarajevo and she saw the carnage there in Sarajevo and she said, my biggest challenge was to come back to those rooms in the White House, the Situation Room, and to explain what I saw. And when she said to them, gentlemen, uh, they will never uh, forgive us for, doing, for, for what's happening there, they said to her, don't be so emotional, Madeleine. And she said, that really, really aggravated me because that's the way that they treat women all the time. And no, I think, to answer your question, I think there should be much more women in position, in key position, definitely. And they bring something else to the negotiation which men, we men, don't have. And what did men bring that we don't have? <laughs> oh, she transformed the attitude of um, uh, Republicans and nationalists to the British government. I mean, it, she was so unusual, so um, uh, different from her predecessors in the Conservative governments that it really really transformed things. But I was also thinking about the Taliban. You know, it's quite hard to persuade the Taliban to turn up with female negotiators. Mm -hmm. But what the Republican side did was they turned up with female negotiators, particularly Fatima Gilani, mm -hmm. who actually did transform things in the room. At first, the, uh, the Taliban wouldn't listen to women when they spoke. And then, but over time, particularly given her religious expertise, she was able to really transform the way it worked. So I think if we keep trying in terms of getting women negotiators involved, it will take time. You know, even Sinn Féin, they used to, at the beginning of the negotiations, Adams and McGuinness would turn up whenever things were televised with two women with them. And then as soon as the cameras left, the women were told to leave the room and they would stay and negotiate. And nowadays, the parties north and south are led by two women, so things change. Well, the Ardesh is still mostly men. Yeah, yeah but it's still something. True. Um, there's a lady over there who had her hand up very early, and then I'm going to read uh, off the screen. In fact, I'll read off the screen while we're getting the microphone over there. We've got Gregory Beatty calling in from Yangon. You've shared some valuable and fascinating insights on the human factor, the relationships, and the trust building in conflict resolution. I'm interested to hear how much emphasis the lead negotiator should put on planning a robust negotiation strategy and sticking to it, or should flexibility and adaptability lead? Go on, Jonathan. Well, this is one of the things that drives me nuts, that people, uh, if you're having a military campaign or a political campaign, people will draw up a strategy, have a plan, prepare for it properly. Negotiations, they think they can just turn up and it's going to be all right. And I, I just find that absolutely infuriating. With uh, Juan Manuel Santos in, in Colombia, he really did it properly. He uh, had this secret back channel, just as we had a secret back channel in Northern Ireland, and there was in Israel too for Oslo. Uh, and he used that to set up the negotiations, but then he called a group of people, including me, to try and help him think it through. And we went through all the previous negotiations, particularly Kagwan. We looked at the other lessons from elsewhere in the world. We had a former... Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo ben Ami from the time of Camp David, and we came up with a strategy. Now, the point about a strategy is it doesn't, like a military strategy, survive the first impact contact with the enemy. You have to change it. But if you have a plan and the process of planning, you know what your red lines are, and you can succeed. That's why the Columbia negotiations succeeded and why so many others failed. Unless you have those firm foundations, a clear strategy from the beginning, you're lost almost from the word go. I agree completely. Camp David is a very good example of, of having a strategy. Dennis 
had a strategy from, for every day, and then the first day he's meeting Barack, and Barack says to him, I don't agree to your strategy, and from that moment the, the, it collapsed, it collapsed the, the, the summit collapsed. So strategy is good to have, but you have to be flexible. Thank you. Yes. Can you say who you are? Get the mic to work, that is. Oh, I, is it on? Yeah, yes. brilliant. Hi, uh, Louise Jones, ex-Army officer, and I now work in damage assessment. Um, I think it's interesting that you referred to earlier to um, almost, you made it sound like it's a prerequisite for negotiations that you have a mutually painful stalemate. Um, and obviously you had a key role in the negotiations, but I also imagine with the British government's oversight of the police and security service, you also played a role, however indirect, in creating that mutually painful stalemate. Uh, interested in your views on how you balance those two roles and whether it is getting that balance wrong, for example, uh, creating that mutually painful stalemate that is perhaps hindering progress in the Middle East? Uh, most of the work in creating the mutually hurting stalemate in Northern Ireland had been done long before we came to office. It was, uh, I think the British Army had really realised there had to be negotiations from the end of the 70s, beginning of the 1980s. I think Adams and McGuinness, when they reached their 30s in the mid-80s, realised they had to, that they were never going to win. They were never going to be defeated, but they were never going to win. And that's when they started reaching out first to John Hume and then to the Irish government and then finally to the British government. So it had been, that, that mutually hurting state might have been created by the intelligence services, the army, the police, uh, and that enabled the negotiation to happen, but it takes quite a long time. So I don't think I, I played a, a key role in that. But, the, uh, but there is a balance, obviously, because you're carrying on with intelligence work and... And we had a few, as, as John Alderay sitting in front of you will remember, a few um, <laughs> ups and downs on that, including in the Assembly. Um, uh, uh, but th but that, that was really managing it rather than creating the mutually hurting stalemate. In Israel, the problem is that the wall has, uh, seems to have worked in terms of stopping um, uh, suicide bombing. So there is no mutually hurting stalemate. One side's hurting, but the Israeli side's not hurting. So how would you convince the Israeli people to negotiate? And yet you don't want to sort of start suicide bombing again in order to get a negotiation. So there's a problem. It's the same in Cyprus, of course, with David Hannay, uh, north and south, with the, uh, the south now perfectly happy. Why would you negotiate? Um, uh, so that you do need to have that mutually hurting stalemate, but the limits to how you can sort of create it. You don't want to cause terrorism in order to enable a negotiation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that sanctions do what we think they do. And I'm not sure they ever have done what we thought they do. I'm not sure they will in Russia. For I don't think sanctions have much impression on Putin at all. They make us feel a bit better about things, and they make life worse for the Russian people. In Iraq, I think they made wor life worse for the Iraqi people. They didn't make much impression on Saddam, who found ways around them. And you see the same in, in Myanmar now and virtually everywhere else. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have sanctions, because governments have to show they're doing something. But I, I've never seen a Even in South Africa and, R and Rhodesia, I think you could argue it was not sanctions that brought about the change. So I'm not convinced that sanctions are sufficient. We're going to take two. Sir, we're going to go for you, and then you the way. Ajir Timur, a former writer on the Middle East for the Times. I want to ask you, sir, whether Shimon Peres told me a lie once. Um, he said to me, um, in a group of pe small group of people, he said, I blame uh, Clinton for the failure of the Camp David talks. And I said, why? He said, every time Arafat wanted something, um, he would go back into the hall with, with, with uh, Clinton, and Clinton would come back and have, having given in completely to what Arafat wanted, and that broke the back of the negotiations. Is this right? Well, if, if this is what Paris told you, from what I heard from the negotiators, I cannot, it's not true. From what I heard from the negotiators, basically they were not, Camp David was not really pre well prepared. The American and the Israelis didn't understand what the, what the minimum, let's say the minimum requirements by the Palestinians. They didn't understand that. They thought that, the, Barack thought that if he will give 80% of the West Bank or 85% of the West Bank, Arafat will, will say, wow, yes, let's do that. Or Jerusalem, they didn't prepare. I can tell you one crazy story which um, the head of the Channel 2 Israel News told me that during Camp David, he gets a call from someone from the Israeli team who asks him uh, to bring a professor, an Israeli professor, to discuss what the solution in Jerusalem will be. 
And he says to him, why should I bring this professor to discuss what the Jerusalem? He said, well, they called him two weeks ago from Camp David and they asked him to fax. Shlomo Benami was in his lecture and this professor gave a, a kind of description what the, what the solution in Jerusalem should be. Palestinian controlling the upper, Israelis calling, controlling the underground. And he faxed this, this solution to, to Camp David. And this became the Israeli official uh, you know, uh, uh, solution for the problem of Jerusalem. So they didn't really prepare themselves for the crucial point that were to be discussed in, in Camp David. And that's the source of the failure there. The Americans didn't do their homework, the Israelis didn't do their homework, and definitely also the Palestinians didn't do their homework. When you get into a summit like Camp David, everything has to be, you know, the, there's only small things, small details that need to be closed. The gaps were so immense in Camp David, no way they could bridge, it, bridge them there. And regrettably, regrettably, really, the collapse of Camp David brought down the peace camp in Israel completely, because Barak said when he came back from Camp David, we don't have a partner in the other side. And this, all the left-wingers believe that there is no partner in the other side. And the consequence of, of that failure is something that we live on until today. Forgive me, I've just realized we're running over time, but I'm going to take one last question. Is that on? <coughs> Arthur Perrick, um, Army Officer. Thank you very much, John and Draw. It's been an exceptional insight. So I guess a very quick question. Would you consider the West's, West's withdrawal from Afghanistan an example of successful negotiation? <laughs> and partly interlinked, how do you assess Donald Trump's negotiation skills? <laughs> Good way to end. Two, pro two provocative questions. Um, well, on the first question on Afghanistan, we worked on Afghanistan for five years with uh, uh, President Ghani and with the uh, Republic negotiating team and Dr. Abdullah. Uh, and no, I don't think one can suggest this was an enormously successful um, negotiation, but I think it's important to work out why it wasn't, because some people just argue it was never going to be a successful negotiation, it was impossible. I don't think that's true. I think we made a series of mistakes uh, in our history. I think in 2001, 2004, we should have been ready to negotiate with the Taliban at that stage. I was in government at the time. I didn't know that uh, uh, President Karzai had put that to the Americans and suggested it after talking to the Taliban and being turned down by Rumsfeld and told that it was not possible something we should have thought of at the time. When I left government in 2007, I said publicly on the basis of my experience talking to the IRA, and we ought to be prepared to talk to um, the Taliban. And uh, it was denounced by my former colleagues in the Foreign Office saying it's fine to talk to PLO, fine to talk to the IRA, but not to uh, the Taliban. And there was an opportunity at that stage to negotiate. So we left it too late. And when Trump came in to negotiate, he negotiated on the basis he was going to leave anyway, so his negotiators had no legs to stand on. The Taliban could simply wait. They never actually put forward a proposition. Um, Zal Khalazad just kept putting forward more and more propositions until they accepted one of them. Uh, and then there was never an empowered negotiation between uh, the Afghan side and the, um, uh, and the Taliban. And then the final straw was when, because it could even then it could have worked if the Americans had maintained conditionality, but once uh, Biden decided to pull conditionality and say, not just we're leaving, but we're leaving and we have no conditions, then the Taliban put down their pens because they had actually even put on paper some considerations on elections and things like that. It died. So it was a series of mistakes that made it not work, not that, election, not that negotiations themselves were impossible. And it's a good object lesson that we should try and learn lessons from. Well, Donald Trump. Look, I, I mean... I will go back a little bit in history because history is important to learn. The first Arab leader that broke the taboo between Israelis and Arabs was Anwar Sadat. He was a great leader. And basically what Anwar Sadat did is until then the Arab was like kind of one block which says all or nothing. So you get, if you want peace, you have to do something with all of us. Not, and Sadat basically broke that kind of mold and said, no, I will sign a peace treaty with Israel. Regrettably, he paid with his life for that. And from that moment on, the Arab world was also, we will not do separate peace talks with Israel, on, only together. All, you have to solve the Palestinian conflict first, and then we might come. What Donald Trump did, basically, he kind of broke that mold again, where he managed, well, it's a deal. I mean, he gave them something, he gave the... the the Sudanese out of the state sponsoring terror. He gave the Qataris or the Emirates 
the F-35, the, the, the airplane. So each one got, got what they wanted, but it was a deal. The real issue here is not whether Israel can sign peace treaties with Qatar or with Bahrain or with the Emirates or with Morocco. We don't have problem. I mean, there is no dispute between those. It's only the main problem is the Palestinian problem. When you solve the Palestinian problem, probably all the Arab world will, will, will come uh, to sign peace with Israel. What Trump showed in that is that the Arab world is not united again against Israel, that you can sign separate peace agreements. I don't know if it's good for the cause of the Palestinian, but that's what, what, what it showed. And there are, I mean, there are tourists, Israeli tourists in Abu Dhabi, in Bahrain, and, and there is flourishing relations now. So I cannot really tell, I mean, it was a deal for him. You know, he, he also proposed the deal of a century between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Palestinians laughed at that, the Israelis laughed. So the core issue is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, nothing more. Well, look, that's a, a, a nice place to end, given that it leads straight into watching your film, as I hope many of us will very soon. Uh, can I say an enormous thank you to Jonathan Jadro for their extraordinary insights. It was a fantastic conversation. I'm very grateful to have been invited. And thanking Tom Tuggenhart, Jonathan Powell, and Joel Murray for a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and can I just say a quick thank you to Jacqueline Jinks, uh, the director of the Strategy Forum. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>